The following program is sponsored by Friends of Life Outreach International. Next on Life Today, Mark Moore helps us connect with God by knowing the Bible better using a common sense 15 minute daily guide. Instead of asking, is Jesus God? What if we asked, is God Jesus? Hmm. So here's, here's the way I would ask it. What do you know about God that you know about God because you believe Jesus is God? There is no other religion that I'm aware of that has these three views of God. Hi, I'm Sheila Walsh. Welcome to Life Today. Now, I know that when you see me on the set, I'm usually by myself, but every now and again, um, I either meet someone or I read a book and I think, okay, my people will love this. And this book, Core 52, I, I can't remember if somebody sent it to me or how I got it, but the minute I got it, my husband said, um, can I look at that? And it's just... Totally, I haven't got it back since. I had to kind of beg, steal, and borrow to get it today. So I invited the author, and I want to, I want to thank you, Mark Moore, for being here. Thank you. And thank you for writing this book. I wanted to ask. Um, it's kind of an intriguing book, Core 52, a 50-minute, 50 15-minute daily guide to build your Bible IQ in a year. What was the genesis of this book? What, what was in your heart writing this? Yeah, I mean, thanks for asking. We, I, I serve in a local church. And it's one of those churches that uh, the Lord's just blessed us. I, I, I can't explain what he's doing. It's, it's out in Phoenix, Arizona. Last year, we baptized 4,235 people. Wow. So all these people are coming in. And what we know is that engaging the Bible is the number one spiritual discipline for spiritual growth. So as a pastor, I'm a teaching pastor on staff. How can we get our people who need God's word to progress in their faith? How can we actually get, it, get into it? Because it's a big book. Where mm -hmm. do I start? It's yeah. an old book. I get lost every time I get to Leviticus. <laughs> so I, I ran across this idea. We've all heard of the 80-20 principle where 80% of the results you get from anything, whether it's business or sports or studying for a test, 80% of your results are from 20% of your effort. Wow. So why am, why am I telling new people read the Bible instead of showing them where the treasure troves are, which, I mean, you've been in the business long enough, you know, there are certain verses that just pack a little bit more punch. Oh, absolutely. And so I've identified the 52 verses that preachers across the country have preached more often. And we've just given a simple guide mm -hmm. so that people can get into those passages it, not only get into those passages, but see the connectivity of those ideas across the Bible. So, for example, we begin with, in the beginning, God created. There are hundreds of verses about creation through the Bible. But if you get that one, yeah. suddenly begin to put into place all those other verses that really take that one single important idea and drive it from Genesis to Revelation. So when somebody gets, works the whole way through this book... What's your prayer at the end of that, that they will have a greater understanding of all the tenets of the faith? Yeah, actually, understanding is the least of my concerns. Really? Yeah, it, it, it really is. I don't want, I don't just want people getting into the Bible, nor the Bible getting into them. I want the Bible coming out of them. And that's great. And, and again, I'm dealing with church, with people in a real church, then we're trying to win our valley for Jesus Christ. How are they going to do that if they don't have confidence? I want to, I want to give the Holy Spirit the ammunition he needs in every individual's lives to have that conversation around one of these 52 ideas of the Bible. Okay, so there's so much. I mean, so obviously we can't hit on all 52 on a wee program. Yeah. So I just, I'm going to throw a couple of titles out to you and, and see if you'll unpack them for us. Um, I found the chapter on identity fascinating mm. in a mm. very self-absorbed culture. Yeah. So Genesis 126, which I would put in the top 10 verses of the Bible, not just the top 52. God created us in our image. So what does that mean? Well, I'm, I, I'm not sure I can unpack all of that, but it at least means that where I am different than animals, I'm like God. Wow. Mm -hmm. So for example, what do we do that animals don't do? We eat communally. No, no animal sets the table. No animal calls a meal. No animal has Thanksgiving. That's one. <laughs> 
<laughs> time. No animal looks at his watch in the morning. That's the first thing we do. Wow. No animal communicates with abstract thoughts. No animal, actually, no animal sings. You go, well, birds sing. No, they call. Hmm. They don't sing. They don't write songs. They don't write poetry. They don't write novels. Here's another one. And women are, are more of this than men, but we decorate everything. <laughs> So unless, unless you're in nature right now, you have something on your body or around you that is artwork. So if you look at those four, this is, this is what is extraordinary to me. Where we are most like God is where life is most mundane. Wow. In our conversations, wow. in, in our meals, in our art, so that every day, in every important way, we can connect to our creator. And if you would wake up for just a moment and just realize who you are, this, this creature that, that expresses the nature of God in the most mundane ways, what a, different, what a difference it would make when you look in a mirror. I should probably move on, but I want to ask another question about that because one of the things I get back from Facebook is the number of people who are desperately lonely who think they're connected, but they're actually not in community. That's right. And you talk about the importance of community. Yeah, there's, there's one chapter where we actually unpack the communal nature of the church. And mm. our, our culture has this gravitational pull to individualism, which is pulling us away from our created nature. So God created, and, and in Genesis 1, 26, I mean, this is the, the Jewish text, let us mm. create man in our own image. God himself is a community. When you take yourself out of the community, you lose your identity. Wow. Because I'm not, I'm not me without we. That's, that's a heavy thought. I mean, that's because I think of the number of people who think they're connected, but are, but it's almost like it's soul destroying because mm -hmm. you're not, there's joy and sorrow and accountability in community. And you don't get that. Now, okay, I'm going to move on to one that I think is an intimidating uh -huh. concept, and that is holiness. Oh, yeah. In fact, one of my coworkers, after he read it, he came into my office the next day and he says, dude, just blew my mind. <laughs> because we think of holiness as being morally right. And it's usually what we don't do. We don't drink. We don't smoke. We don't sleep around. And so Christianity is more known for what we hate than what we love. Wow. Because of a misunderstanding, holiness is not your behavior. It's God's declaration. So holiness, technically, the Hebrew word means set apart. So there's something that you have, I have, we all have that's set apart. It's our toothbrush. <laughs> now, a, a toothbrush is a pretty versatile instrument, right? You could scrub grout with it. You could, you know, clean vents with it, but you don't. Why? Because you set it apart for one person, for one purpose, and that's to clean your teeth. That's a s silly illustration maybe, but it makes the point that God set you apart. Now, all of our moral behavior is a consequence of God setting us apart. It's not the cause of God setting us apart. And man, if I could just beg you for a minute to give yourself permission to just be God's child and not try to work for it, mm -hmm. that chapter on holiness is a game changer for our perception of the kind of relationship we can have with God. Yeah, I, um, that's one of the chapters that my husband has underlined more than anything because he and I were both brought up in traditions where it was things we had to do so that God would love yeah, us more, yeah. as opposed to just waking up with this delight every morning of knowing that God looks at you and says, that's my boy, which yeah. is a beautiful thought. Okay, you have a, um, a chapter on God as shepherd. Mm, mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Yeah, that's an interesting one for me because um, I, my past is I'm a bit of a biblical historian. Mm -hmm. And so... And I've traveled in the Middle East extensively. And so you look at shepherding in the Middle East, the reality is shepherds are on the lower rungs of the social totem pole. Hmm. They're, they're dirty. And for Jews, that rendered them unclean. So when you look at a shepherd, you don't go, oh boy. You say, oh boy. And yet theologically, shepherd is applied to God, mm -hmm. to Jesus, to elders in the church, to the leaders of Israel. It's like really elevated. And there's a, I think this message in there that is, is about leadership, that to be exalted as a leader in the Bible, you become humble and serve. Mm -hmm. The coolest thing about shepherding for me is in most parts of the world, Scotland included, they drive sheep. Yes. Not in the Bible. No. They call sheep. They lead sheep. They know sheep. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's a... 
if you want to be a leader of a business, a family, or even of yourself, that's probably a good chapter to dig into. Yeah, there's something so profoundly um, comforting about that image, because my mom was a farm accountant. She did the accounts of the shepherds mm. in our neighborhood. And I was used to seeing the spring lambs being born. I was used to seeing the shepherds coming behind the, the sheep with the two dogs. But the idea that Christ goes ahead is, is just a beautiful, a beautiful picture. Now you have obviously one core um, is Jesus. Yeah. What would be surprising to people in that chapter? Uh, are you talking about the one on the incarnation or the prediction of Jesus? I was talking about the one on the incarnation, but I, I like the sound of that other one too. Yeah, so the incarnation, um, again, I'm a classically trained theologian by trade, not bragging, confessing. And <laughs> so guys like me usually get around the incarnation. We go, how could God become a man? And we start trying to describe the physics of it, which is uh, frankly a worthless conversation. We're never gonna understand it. So I wanna turn the question around. Instead of asking, is Jesus God? What if we asked, is God Jesus? Hmm. So here's, here's the way I would ask it. What do you know about God that you know about God because you believe Jesus is God? And there are three things that literally, this is not a criticism of any other religious tradition, it's just a fact. There is no other religion that I'm aware of that has these three views of God. Number one, that God is near. Mm. Now, some religions will say God is near, but they're pantheistic. Yeah. You give God a name and you push him far away. So God is near. Number two, that God suffers. Mm. Nobody believes that but Christians. Yeah. And number three, that God loves his enemies. Wow. The most powerful things we believe about God, we believe about God because of the incarnation. Yeah. And here's where it went a step further for me. If I wanna be a good man, a good husband, a good father, if I wanna be a good leader in the church, guess what characteristics I need? I need to be near, I need to love my enemies, and I need to suffer for the people I care about. Wow. So in incarnation for me is not a theological tenet, it's a yeah. way of living that even if I didn't believe it in the Bible, I would still have to preach it in the church because it's the only way of being fully human. And being made in the image of God. That was a mouthful, sorry. No, that was, that's, that's profound. You talk about um, the cross and the importance of the cross. Are oh, we the only religion whose God died for us? I, I think there are some Greek mythologies where gods die, but they, 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 they do come back. It's not, it's not like the resurrection though. Mm -hmm. I think that, I think that is, Yes, I would say yes. But here's, here's where, for me, that idea of the cross is even thicker than just God dying for you. Because as I think about it, how can I get up to God? And every religion offers a path. But how can a human being ascend to the divine nature? The divine? We can't. So that God came to us is critically important. That he died for us is unbelievable. But a lot, it's not the majority, but a strong percentage of cross talk in the Bible is not the cross of Jesus. It's your cross, that you pick up a cross, you mm -hmm. carry a cross. Mm -hmm. And I got to thinking through that whole process. Why did Jesus keep saying that? And I'm just gonna say it as simply and crisply as I can. When Jesus died on his cross, he saved individuals' souls. When Christians pick up their cross, we save society. What do you mean by that? When Christians live on the path of Jesus, self-sacrificially, mm -hmm. women's rights, human trafficking, I, I know you're gonna talk about uh, f feeding the hungry in Africa, that only happens when Christians begin living this cruci cruciform lifestyle. So truly, Jesus' plan was to save the world. He saves our souls by his individual death. He saves the world when the church lays down their life and lives for the world that Jesus died for. I'm thinking of a mom watching this program. Um, you know, she's got three children at home and she loves the Lord, but she's like, how do I take up my cross every day and follow him? What does that mean for me? But you just said it, she's a mom. Hmm. There is no one more viciously sacrificial than a mother. And my concern for that mom at home is not that she would feel uh, insignificant as a Christian, but that she would understand what she does in her home is a become a transformative agent. She's sacrificing herself, 
her finances, her, even her physical body for children who will live a life and, and address needs of society beyond her. I can't think of a more sacrificial Christ-like thing mm -hmm. than being a mom. You talk about gaining grit. What, mm. what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, I, I ran across this study by Angela Duckworth who looked at uh, West Point graduates, salesmen who were successful. Uh, she looked at first year teachers in poor districts and spelling bee champions. <laughs> and they, those people have nothing Very in common. Very diverse. Yeah, <laughs> but she looked at the winners in each of those and asked what makes them winners. Had nothing to do with IQ, gender, nationality, or education. It was grit, it was grit. Simply defined is the ability to get up one more time than you get knocked down. Mm. You've got grit. Now, the question that Angela Duckworth didn't answer is how do I get grit? The Bible actually answers that. It's Hebrews chapter 12. Oh. It's, it is a four step process of gaining grit where you look at something ahead and you live for a reward that's in the future. Also, it says, turn your eyes on Jesus because you're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Mm -hmm. Those witnesses, they're not like beer belly people in the stands. <laughs> Those are the saints that are standing the sideline having run their lap and passed the baton to you. Mm -hmm. Their grit gives us grit. And it's gritty people like Abraham and Noah and Rahab mm -hmm. all have checkered paths. And sometimes the reason I have to look at the people around me is because I realize they're not better than me morally. They just got up one more time than they got knocked down. That's, that's powerful. I've, I have a new book I, I wrote on, I wrote a book called Praying Women. Yeah. And I, I would love to know what you say in your chapter on prayer. Well, the, the, Lord, the Lord's Prayer obviously is this magnificent genius template for praying. And so I'll just be honest with you, I need to read your book because <laughs> Prayer is probably my least. That's why I wrote the book. It was mine too. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, because we're doers and we mm -hmm. want to be out there doing things. We forget that going to, going to the God of the universe. If you're in a company in secular, you say going to the CEO and asking for what you need is the most powerful thing you can do in a day. And so I'm trying to look at how the Lord's Prayer becomes a template for us. I will tell you, just to, to, to condense it down, the on, there's one word in the Lord's Prayer that if, if I understood this, it would change my prayer life, which indicates that I don't. It is the very opening word, Father. Hmm. There's no Jew other than Jesus ever prayed to God, Father. And you look at Jesus' prayers, every single prayer begins, Father. Hmm. Except when he's quoting a scripture on the cross, that's the outlier. If I knew that God was my Father, hmm. I would ask more, I would ask better, I would ask incessantly. So whatever else you get out of the book and you read that chapter on prayer, understand God's your father. Mm. It's beautiful. I think we've already got time for one more. You, ha you write on mentoring. And I think that's a huge thing. And it's something, I'm getting a lot of requests from younger women. And Good. honestly, I'm not quite sure how to do it. Yeah. What, 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 do, you, what do you say about mentoring? Well, I've been, before I give the answer, let me just say, Every chapter in this book also has a five minute teaching video on core52.org. It's free, it's online, oh, wow. anybody can access it. And if you wanna take seriously memorizing the verses, mm -hmm. there's another three minute video on memorizing those verses. Again, that's core52.org. So tons of other resources other than just the book. I will say this about mentoring, as I've been doing this with young men for 25 years. Nobody is ever good at it. What I do for young men has nothing to do with taking a book and leading them through it. It's not about giving magic bullets. I'm, I'm mentoring three F-35 pilots right now in, in Phoenix. The only thing, like I look at these guys and go, why would you, why would you want me? Because mm -hmm. nobody sees themselves in the mirror the way people see you on stage. That's true. Here's the secret of mentoring. 25 years. I can help the person in front of me see themselves through the windshield instead of the rear view mirror. Hmm. All of us look at our past, yeah. and then we share ourselves through our past. If I can get a young man or you a young woman to see their potential instead of their past, boom, that's a, that's a game changer. 
Thank you for calling me a young woman. <laughs> there is so much more. I mean, obviously you can tell we haven't even scratched the surface. And, and I would also say to all of you um, girls out there, even though I will get this back from Barry, it, this would be a great gift to give to your husband as well and get one for yourself. But, but as you know, one of the things we're passionate about here at Life is that for everything that God has deposited in us, that we reach out and be an answer to the prayers of those who desperately need some help and they need it right now. So I wanna ask, would you watch this with me and then we'll talk about how you and I can make a difference. The birth of a child is one of the most transcendent moments in time the miracle of life. Tiny hands and feet, we instinctively see they're created in the image of God. And over time, they grow into the young men and women they were designed to be. At least, that's every parent's hope and prayer. I, I don't know if you can, oh, darling, I don't wanna to touch it. I don't wanna hurt you, but can you see her skin? Her skin has begun to literally peel off her body. Throughout Africa, terrible events like famine and drought have decimated entire communities and left many with little or no food. The devastating effects of severe food shortages are most visible in the children. With severe malnutrition, the first organ to shut down is the skin. It's as if all the reserves go to try and protect what's left inside. James and Betty, you have sat here over and over and over through the years, faithfully serving and feeding millions. But I know you'll see this. This mom, who is desperate like any mom would be to save the life of her precious child, had to travel 30 kilometers to get here. But it's why mission feeding matters so much. We talk about life, where it's needed most, where it's needed most is in the villages where these darling children live. Because this mom shouldn't have to travel 30 kilometers with a desperately sick little lamb. They need our help and they need it now. I will never ever forget my first day in a malnutrition clinic in Africa. And honestly, I mean, I was brought up in Scotland to be aware of things like that. My mom would sit us all down and we'd watch and we'd give to different things. But it's totally different when you're on the ground and you feel the heat and you're aware of, of the aromas, of the smell everywhere. And then you see the children. I mean, I had no idea. I mean, I was so ignorant. I mean, I, I asked one of our translators, you know, why does this child have red hair? And he said, because there's no protein in her system. That's what happens, and that's why her skin is peeling off. And so that's why mission feeding is so important to us, because we don't want a mother to have to travel all those miles to come to a malnutrition clinic. We want to go to the villages so they never have to show up in a malnutrition clinic. And the great thing is we've worked with um, those who know what's needed for those particular people in that particular area in terms of nutrition, and we have our own factories now where we make this food, and before I handed out those bowls, I mean, it kind of looks like oatmeal. I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to try it myself first. And, and it's got all the vitamins and minerals and protein. And literally, honestly, from the first bowl, you're turning from death to life for that child. And these moms, they're just like you and me. You know, you might even think, well, if that family lived next door to me, I would take care of that in a heartbeat. We're bringing that family and placing that family right next door to you. You don't have to get on a plane and fly for 17 hours. You don't have to do that. You know, we will go and show you what the needs are and then ask, will you help us? And you can do it for so little. We've made a commitment to be able to feed 350,000 children this year. But let me break that down for you. If you can give $30, that will feed three children for three months. I mean, think about that. I mean, you go to a movie, some terrible movie, and buy popcorn, you've already blown more than $30. But you could feed three children for three months. $50 would feed five children. 100 feeds 10. And if, if you're able to, if God has blessed your business, then $1,000 would feed 100 children. That's like a whole village. I've been to both places. 
I've been to the malnutrition clinic and wept with these mothers who are desperate. And I've been to the villages where we've set up the feeding programs in school so that they'll have to come to school to get a good meal, to get an education, to break the cycle of poverty. We promised that we're going back soon to Angola and we promised we're coming back with help. Would you help us please go to your phone, make the very best gift possible. Let's eradicate hunger in Jesus' name. Mission Feeding began with a promise to be there in times of crisis for thousands of hurting and hungry children in their time of need. Now more than ever, we need your help to save lives by feeding and caring for children across the continent of Africa. With food reserves gone and many areas experiencing severe famine, we urgently need to replenish our supplies to reach the 350,000 children who are counting on us. Your gift of love can be the miracle answer to a desperate mother's prayer. Call now with your life-saving gift of 30, 50, or $100 that will help feed and care for three, five, or 10 children for three full months. With your gift, we'll send you the Global Impact of Life Journal. This soft cover journal includes pictures from the mission field and inspiring scriptures as a reminder of your impact in giving to bless lives around the world. With your gift of $100 or more, please request the Global Impact Bible. This English Standard Version presents a fascinating guide to the impact of the best-selling book of all time, filled with quotes from well-known figures, photographs, and reproductions of fine art. It highlights the many surprising ways Scripture has shaped civilization. Finally, with your gift of $1,000 or more to help feed and care for 100 children, be sure to request our commemorative bronze sculpture, A Mother's Strength. Please call, write, or make your gift online today. Thank you so much. And for any gift at all, I will send you a copy of, well, it won't actually be me, it'll be our other people here, of Core 52, fantastic book, impacting my family. And Mark, I just want to say thank you for writing this. And we just pray God's favor on this book because I really think it would impact our nation. So yeah. thank you. Thanks for having me. It's wonderful. Give, give a good gift. Yeah. And um, thanks for being with me. I'll see you next time uh, on Life Today. So have a good day. We'll talk to you later. When life fell apart, Sherry Rose Shepherd learned to walk with God. And now I have joy before the healing. Life Today is made possible by the supporters of Life Outreach International. Your gift will be used exclusively for the exempt purposes of life. The ministry features specific outreaches as examples of the programs it supports and conducts. Gifts are considered to be without restriction as to use unless explicitly stipulated by the donor. The ministry is a member of the ECFA.